Please do have your Bibles open at Genesis chapter 2 as we look at the, some of the verses that we read earlier. I promise and covenant. That used to be a standard form of words when people were making solemn obligations. When a man and a woman were promising to be faithful to each other for life, they would promise and covenant. The word is removed from the vows now, but it's still mentioned in the service. Just before the ceremony, the minister says, as a token of the covenant into which you're entering, give to each other the right hand. And in that way, you're giving yourself to the other person without reservation. On a five or ten point note, it still says, I promise to, bear, to pay the bearer on demand the sum of five pounds. No mention of covenant anymore. The way money is being printed these days, with no hard currency behind it, it's not surprising. Will those promises someday fall flat? When you're buying a house, the word covenant is still there. That's probably the most expensive thing you'll ever buy. So you want it to be a serious arrangement without any possibility of one side pulling out or not keeping the promises. We come today to a short series on the biblical idea of covenant. The Bible is a covenant document. It should really be called the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. That's a better word than the word testament. It's a fuller and richer and deeper word. And we do find God entering into covenants with well-known people, with Noah, with Abraham, with Moses, with David. I'll have more to say about that next week, God willing. A covenant is a formal binding arrangement generally between two people. Before there ever is a covenant with human beings, the three persons who are God enter into covenant themselves. Again, I'm not going to say very much about that now, but we have an example of that in Genesis chapter 1. If you just look back to chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, <coughs> over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And notice at the beginning of that verse it says, Us, let us make man. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are agreeing together to create man, male and female, to have certain qualities in common with God. That's what the, the idea of image means. Our desire to relate to someone beyond ourselves. That comes from God. Our ability to look after others, to harness this world, as verse 26 is talking about, that comes from God. The three persons who are God are discussing together, planning together, committing themselves to this enterprise, covenanting together, because this creation will bring a cost. And we'll see that that is an intrinsic part of covenant. It will bring responsibilities. And then in Genesis chapter 2, when God has made man in his own image, he enters into covenant with him. And we can find that in verses 15 to 17. It has been called more lately the covenant of creation. But I'll call it by the older, more common name, the covenant of works. As we were saying with the children, this is not just something long ago and far away. This has implications for you and me today. 
So let's look at the two trees together. Our title is The Two Trees and the Covenant of Works. The Two Trees and the Covenant of Works. And I just want to ask three questions which should help us to understand this covenant. And the first question, just quite simply, is what are the two trees? What are the two trees? And certainly the picture will give you an idea of what they are or what they're not. And we read about them first in verse 9 of Genesis 2. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They're mentioned there along with the other trees that the Lord God made to burst out of the ground. In that creation week there were things happening that don't happen the same way today. And look how generous the Lord God is to Adam. Look at verse 16. The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. And what it actually says is, eating, you may eat. And that's a a kind of a, a Hebrew form of words, which means you may start eating, you may go on eating, You may eat your fill to your heart's delight. Eating, you may eat. This is fantastic. Who were the first ones to hear this chapter? Or possibly to read it? Moses is writing. Children Children of Israel, that's right. And for them... What came from a king's garden was reserved for the king's family. The gardener would work in the king's garden, but he wouldn't dare eat from it. But here the king of creation gave his Adam, his gardener, permission to eat from every tree in the garden. And don't forget, it is rich, it is fruitful. Just go through the supermarket someday and just think about this. See how many kinds of fruit there are in the supermarket from all over the world. Bananas and coconuts, pineapples, pomegranates. And I think there were probably fruits in Eden that we've never heard of because unfortunately the garden had to be barred so that Adam couldn't get back in. So Adam can have a different fruit each day or a fruit salad just as he chooses. I'm not sure about vegetables, but that's definitely fruits. And the two trees, at the end of verse 9, they fit in with the rest. They're ordinary trees, if we can call anything in that garden ordinary. They look good, just like the rest. Their fruit tastes good, just like the rest. These are real trees in a real garden. They do certainly have a symbolic meaning, but they are real trees. And it's not one good tree and one bad tree. God never made anything bad. They're both good trees. I think it's a bit like my study. I don't want to say my study is a good study. But when our boys were small, my study was off limits to them. It wasn't that there was anything bad in my study. Just they weren't allowed to go in there because I said so. Because there were books there, because there were papers there, I didn't want sticky hands on. I didn't really have any other reasons. Adam is not allowed to eat from one tree simply because God says so. Is he going to trust God's word? Nor are these two trees magic trees. The fruit on the tree of life isn't magic by itself. Life comes from obeying God's word. The fruit on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's not poisonous. So that if you eat from that fruit, you'll drop down dead. There's nothing special about either of these trees apart from where they are, in the middle of the garden and apart from the names God gives them. One is the tree of life, 
The other is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God allows Adam to eat from the tree of life, although there will come a point when God will not allow him to. And God is very clear about the other tree. Look at verse 17. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, and literally it is on the day when you eat of it, you will surely die. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now it's not giving some kind of special secret wisdom. It doesn't tell you things that you can't know any other way. Let me just ask a few questions just to get to what's going on here. When Adam receives this command, what is Adam like? What's his nature? He's good. He's good through and through. Why is he good? Because God made him. He's made in God's image. And God is good. That's right. Adam is good because he's related to God. For Adam to know good, he must obey God. He doesn't need to eat from that tree the knowledge of, of good and evil. He doesn't need to eat from that tree to know good. Indeed, God says he mustn't eat from that tree. But if he does eat from that tree, what will he know? He'll know evil. Because evil is to go against God's word. Evil is to disobey God. Evil is to think we know better than God. So good is obeying God and what God says, and evil is the opposite. Disobeying God and what he says. Good and evil are related to God. If Adam disobeys God, he will bring evil into what he thinks, into what he wants, into what he does. And the terrible thing is, as we were saying with the children, this is not just for Adam as a discreet individual. This is for everybody else. He's the head of humanity. So what he does affects everyone, just as the pastry cutter, its shape affects everything that comes from it. So do you see what the two trees are? Real trees, ordinary trees, good trees. They're related to God's word. And they also point beyond themselves. This is where the, the symbolic idea comes in, like a traffic sign. Whenever you see a traffic sign pointing to Alta Galvin Hospital, you know that that sign is not the hospital, but it's pointing to the hospital. The tree of life is pointing to everlasting life for Adam, if he obeys God. <coughs> the other tree is also pointing to life. As long as Adam obeys God and doesn't eat from it, now we come to the second question. Why does the Lord God give this command? Why does the Lord God give this command? And maybe you've asked this question yourself. Maybe you thought everything was going so well until this point, until there was something for Adam to trip over. But you see, Adam doesn't need to trip over it. We have said that Adam is good. He loves God. He wants to obey him. So where's the problem? I have five reasons why the Lord God gives Adam this command. Let me just run through them briefly. See if you can follow them. And I have a, a little mnemonic that I hope will help you to remember them. First of all, God wants to show Adam he is free to choose. He's free to obey God. He's also free to disobey God, although he needs to understand the consequences. Adam's not a puppet for God to pull his strings. He's not a robot someone else controls, nor is he an animal. Many people today say we're just animals, descended from other animals. But animals don't know right or wrong. 
Animals don't listen to God or talk to God. Animals don't have freedom of choice. But Adam has free will. God wants Adam to choose to obey him, to obey him willingly. It's just the same with parents. Parents don't want children to obey them just because they feel they have to. Parents want children to obey them because they see it's right, because it's a mark, it's a sign of love. So that's the first reason God gives this command to show Adam he's free. So remember the word free and an F, free. The second reason is because the Lord God wants to test Adam. So the second word is test. Do you husbands ever test your wives, I wonder? Do you love me enough, dear, to give me the last rouleau? Unlike that, which may not be a very fair test, if you've had all the others before it, this is a very fair test. It's a serious test. God's not putting something in front of Adam that Adam loves most of all, and then saying, you can't eat that, because that would be cruel. <coughs> Nor is God putting something in front of Adam that Adam really hates, and telling him not to eat that, because that wouldn't be a real test. No, God is telling Adam that there are thousands of trees to eat from. Yes, this is a lovely tree, but there are thousands of others. And this one is off limits. Adam must simply obey. And this test shows Adam he's not God. It shows Adam what's in his heart that he's happy to live by this one rule. It will show God that Adam really loves him. If you obey your parents, even when you don't want to, that will show your parents that you really love them. It's easy to obey, obey our parents when we want to. So to do with freedom, to do with a test, the third reason is because God wants to protect Adam. P for protect. That's why he has this one rule. And this world, even as we were singing in our first psalm today, this world works by rules. <coughs> if you want to bake a cake, you have to follow the rules of the recipe. It's no good putting shampoo into the cake instead of milk or soil instead of flour. Or if you want to play a card game, or a computer game, or a game of football, you have to follow the rules. Otherwise it would just be a mess. If you want to drive a car, you have to learn the highway code and pass an exam in it. And that one rule <coughs> is there to protect Adam. If he keeps that one rule, he will live. The rules we follow, especially in, in driving a car, the rules are there to protect us. If you broke the rules and started driving on the right-hand side of the road, you'd soon be in trouble, in danger. The rules God gives us are really like the sides of the Craig Avon Bridge or the Foil Bridge. We don't intend to hit the sides, but the sides are there to protect us from going over the edge to keep us moving in the right direction. Freedom, test, protect. The fourth reason God gives this command is because he wants to bless Adam. This is a special arrangement God is making with Adam. He doesn't have to do this. There's nothing in this for God. This is a covenant. And indeed the name Lord, which we have in Genesis chapter 2, we have God in chapter 1 and Lord God in chapter 2. That's God's close covenant name. This is a serious agreement involving life and death. 
with promises and warnings. As I was saying earlier, God uses covenants to deal with human beings. As you read through Genesis, you'll see God making a covenant with Noah after the flood. You'll see him making a covenant with Abram. We've been studying this last year in our, our midweeks, when God calls Abram to leave the pagan city where he's living. This covenant is a covenant of works. It depends on the works Adam will do. If Adam doesn't do what God commands, this covenant will fall apart. Verse 17, where God gives Adam a stern warning, is part of this covenant. And we'll come to that shortly. But just look at verse 17. Now it is framed in terms of a warning. But you can't change it, you can't turn it round. And see that there's a promise that lies behind it. Verse 17, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you do not eat from it, you shall surely live forever in paradise. You see, this test is only for a short while. If Adam passes the test, which he should do just to thank God for all he's done, God has more blessings in store for him. He will move Adam to a position where he won't ever be able to sin or even think about sinning. And that is heaven itself. If Adam passes this test, God will bring him to heaven or bring heaven to him. That's how God wants to bless him. And don't forget, Adam isn't acting on his own here. He will win heaven for all his descendants as well. And there's a final reason why God gives Adam this command. It's because God wants to save Adam. Now why do I say that? Well, sad to say, there are no more bright chapters in Genesis after this one. What we meet in the brightness of chapter 2 is preparing us for the darkness and the gloom of chapter 3. <clears throat> it's the same garden, it's the same tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but it's as if the light has gone out. This time Adam and Eve aren't listening to their loving God. They're listening to a talking snake. And they're obeying him. Satan is using the snake to tempt them. They're breaking the covenant. They're shattering God's one command. Now this doesn't take God by surprise. God knew, even in his planning to make man, that's why we read from chapter 1 verse 26, in his planning to make man, he knew that his own son would have to take the form of a man. So whenever you read chapter 1, verse 26, Christmas is already in view in Genesis chapter 1. God knows that even though Adam is perfect, he will disobey. And he'll bring the beautiful garden crashing down around him. But God has already planned that another will mend the covenant that Adam will break in order to save Adam and to save millions whom he will give to him. So this tree of the knowledge of good and evil is not a small thing. I would say it's one of the three most important trees in the history of the world. We'll come to the other shortly. But let's just make sure that we've got those five reasons for this command. Because God wants to show Adam that he's free. Because God wants to test Adam. Because God wants to protect Adam. Because God wants to bless Adam. And because God wants to save Adam. And to save many from his family. 
if you remember the phrase, and I've just made up this phrase, but I think it's where these points are pointing. For the promised blood sacrifice. That's a bit of a strange phrase. For the promised blood sacrifice. That's who Jesus is. F-T-P-B-S. For the promised blood sacrifice. You remember those five points. Freedom, test, protect, bless, save. So we come then to the third question. What if Adam doesn't keep the command? What if Adam doesn't keep the command? And that's what the Lord God spells out in verse 17. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. And this is strong language. It's actually the same form of words that we, we met in verse 16. Remember, eating, you shall eat. That's strong, intensive. And this is equally strong. Dying, you shall die. It means you will start to die, you will continue to die, and you will die to the full. Now, nothing had died before this. No animals, nothing. And there are three forms of death bound up here. The first is spiritual death, separation from God. And God says that will happen on the day you disobey. And that does happen. Then there's physical death, the death of Adam's body. And that will begin that day until Adam's body returns to the dust. So there's spiritual death, there's physical death, and there's eternal death. Separation from God forever and ever in hell. These are fearsome consequences. This is a serious matter, a serious covenant. Adam is free to choose, and his choice will bring either life or death, not just for him, but for all who come from his race. As Paul says in that other passage we read, through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned in Adam. What Adam does here affects our nature, affects the way we're born, our actions, our future. What a tale of woe. How suddenly, how completely the light has been turned off. But did you see what Paul is doing in that passage? Let's just finish by looking at Romans 5 verse 19. Romans 5 verse 19. Page 1184. And right through this passage, Paul is comparing what Adam did and the sin and how the sin affected everything, comparing that to something far, far greater of what Jesus did in his life, in his death, in his righteousness. Romans 5 verse 19. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Paul's comparing the first Adam and the last Adam the Lord Jesus Christ. Adam disobeyed and brought in sin and judgment and death for all of us. That's why we sin, because Adam ate that fruit. That's why we will die, because Adam ate that fruit. But the second Adam obeyed every command of his father right through his life. And he brought in righteousness. That's how we can live. That's how we can enjoy heaven forever. Because of what Jesus did. It's all depending on another. Either Adam or Jesus. And the most important tree is the cross of Jesus. Where he paid the death penalty for multitudes of sinners who have broken God's law. 
and deserve to die eternally. A wise man once said, and I've used this picture before, it comes from this, uh, one of the Puritans. He said, in the sight of God, there are only two men, Adam and Christ. And each one has all other men and women hanging at his girdle strings. So are you still in Adam today? I pray not. Facing death in all its fullness. Or have you seen that you can't keep this covenant of works? That Adam has broken it and so there needs to be another arrangement. Are you now trusting in the only one who has kept that covenant? Jesus Christ. And are you therefore already enjoying eternal life? Let's stand and let's talk to God together. Our Father, we do thank you for your truth. And we thank you that you tell us your truth because you love us. We realize that there was no reason for Adam to disobey you. But even so, you knew that he would. You know all things. We thank you that you have put in place, even at the time of Adam's sin, a costly plan to save millions of people who see our fate in Adam, who see our own sin, and believe that Jesus, the last Adam, has obeyed, has kept your law, and has paid the price for our law-breaking, so that we may be saved, so that we may be remade in the image of Jesus. Father, may we know the blessings of eternal life even now because we're trusting in Jesus, because we're understanding more fully what that means in covenant terms. And may we then, being enthused by this good news, may we want to spread this news to others who are still in mortal danger. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close our service by singing part of the, the great covenant psalm, Psalm 89, on page, page 205. Psalm 89, we're going to sing from stanza 24 to 29 to the tune Thanksgiving number 189. And the, the hymn. At the beginning of stanza 24, I'll make him my firstborn. That's David that God is speaking of here. And these are the arrangements for David and his descendants, the covenant with David. But sin, he's talking about sin coming in. Talking about the breaking of the commandments, the forsaking of the law. We have done this. But God is saying in these stanzas that the covenant will continue. Because the holy son of David, looking at stanza 29, once by my holiness I swore, to David I'll not lie, the holy son of David will bear the iniquity. And that's the only way his seed, those who love him, those who are trusting in him, will last always. So Psalm 89, stanzas 24 to 29. Let's praise God.
of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.